Here's a reminder of the type of nephrons we're talking about when we talk about the nephron loop and the medullary gradient that's important for this osmotic um, flow. It's these juxta medullary nephron that have a vasa recta capillary system. The vasa recta is what surrounds these long nephrons that are in the renal medulla. So we are right down near the renal pelvis. So this is what we're talking about with the 1200 milliosmoles down here. These cortical nephrons that are surrounded by paratubular capillaries don't have that same function. A bit actually to so the nephron loops do the same thing but they are not able to the, same, to the same extent. They're not reaching that 1200 milliosmoles to allow for as much water reabsorption um, and solute reabsorption. So they're able to do less, reabsorb less. So this is the entire process. Again, this would be a juxtaglomerular nephron um, and we know that because we're all the way down to the inner medulla. These are the only nephrons that reach that, that far down into the inner medulla um, near the renal pelvis. So we've got the filtrate entering this nephron loop. That filtrate is 300 milliosmoles, so isoosmotic to the blood and to the ISF at this location. As we start to drop down through the outer medulla, inner medulla, deeper and deeper into the medulla, the osmolarity in the ISF starts to go up. ISF osmolarity um, increasing as we go down physically. That's going to result in water reabsorption down that osmotic drive. So at this point, the filtrate entering is like 500. Um, as it enters the renal medulla that is 600, water flows out down its osmotic gradient due to the osmotic gradient um, and concentration in the medulla itself. So this is where water is reabsorbed, first concentrating the filtrate, and then we're going to go back up and dilute it. So here is the maximum concentration in terms of osmolarity that our filtrate is going to get. This is going to depend on how far that loop dips into the medulla. It's going to be equal to the osmolarity in the renal medulla, wherever this nephron loop dips down to. So again, this would be a vasa recta that goes all the way down into near the renal pelvis. A cortical loop would not reach that same max concentration. As we ascend up the ascending loop, we're going to have the reabsorption of salts and that's going to occur for both through passive transport, some here down the electrochemical gradient of those solutes as we right go up and we have decreasing medullary osmotic concentration, there is a drive for those solutes out. There's also a drive for water in, but that's not gonna happen um, we don't have aquaporins there. We don't want there to be because we want to reabsorb stuff. That's what the nephron loop is for. Otherwise we'll get dehydrated. So reabsorption is passive and then actually occurs via active pumping. Active is pumping, right? That's a redundant thing to say of salts. So the sodium, chloride, potassium, that's how we get a osmotic pressure, um, an osmolarity in this filtrate that's lower than the ISF, right? Right here, this is 400. How can it be lower in here than it is out there? Only through active pumping, right? Otherwise it would be an equilibrium. We're pumping out more solutes using ATP to lower the filtrate concentration to even lower than it would be if we didn't have active pumping. 
That's what allows this to be lower osmolarity on the ascending loop than it was in the descending and ultimately reach 100, which is very low osmolarity. From there, our urine can be formed anywhere between 100 and 1200 milliosmoles. That regulation we'll talk about later. Entering the distal collecting duct, we're at 100 milliosmoles because of that nephron loop. First, concentrating the filtrate, then diluting it. Through that process, we reabsorb water, then salts. Pretty darn cool system, if you ask me. I know you're wondering what proteins are doing this. Well, one is going to be aquaporins. I mentioned there's aquaporins present on this descending loop, but not the ascending. Aquaporins facilitate water movement, right? So their water can move more quickly across the plasma membrane if there are aquaporins present. So that's all we need there. What about this active transport over here? That let's zoom into the ascending limb. Here we are, ascending limb, and this is the thick portion where the most active transport occurs. Okay, active transport, what do you think? One thing we're gonna need is a sodium potassium pump. That's going to allow two potassium in, three sodium out. Now, we've got some other fun proteins too. One is called the, let me draw it first, sodium potassium chloride to chloride co-transporter. It's gonna do exactly what it sounds like, which is move sodium in, potassium in, and two chlorides in. This is actually a pump that does this, a co-transport pump. And once these are in here, we can have diffusion. Um, do we have diffusion? Well, diffusion across the cytoplasmic space. And then we've got another protein that allows potassium and chloride out, another co-transporter. This co-transporter symport, same direction, is um, passive transport, so it's not a pump. Does not require ATP, and you know that because we're going down our concentration gradients, right? Chloride moving out, potassium moving out, that's down our concentration gradients. Nothing like a little comparative anatomy to help us understand things. This is pretty cool. So this is zoomed in to a salmon chloride cell. What's cool about biology is that different organisms can use some of the same mechanisms to do similar things. Um, so for salmon, they can actually adjust to live in salt water or fresh water. And the mechanisms by which these salmon um, excrete electrolytes and water is very similar to how our kidneys do it. So this is a salt water example here. Remember that a fish, the salmon, is an osmoregulator, just like we are, but it is a um, marine osmoregulator. So it has to remove salt because it lives in salt water. So how are we going to remove salt from inside the fish out? similar to how we'd want to, in our kidneys, reabsorb. Well, we're gonna have a sodium potassium pump on the basal lateral side, just like we do in our kidneys, right? Basal lateral side of epithelial tissue cells. That results in high sodium out inside the body. Um, and we want to be able to move that, regulate that and get it out. So a couple different proteins do that. One is the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. Same one, right? I had two written in there because um, it actually does, does two chlorides with one of the other ones. This is the same protein we have, right? Where we reabsorb um, on the apical surface. This is going to allow these three ions to move in as well as sodium, 
both through this protein as well as um, some paracellularly. There's then a chloride channel um, that helps that chloride get out of the cell, which is like what, what we saw in us too. Um, ours also had potassium. Okay, so it's a lot like what we do. What's cool is these fish, if they want to go to fresh water, what needs to change? A fresh water osmoregulator needs to be able to get rid of water and obtain, retain, reabsorb, keep um, salts. So go back to um, the diagram of the cell. This is the same cell, cells in fresh water. We again have an osmoregulator, but in this case, we wanna move salts into the body because we're not living in salt water. We need to be able to obtain that. Same protein here, our sodium potassium pump, ATP pump, but this protein now, our sodium potassium chloride co-transporter is on the apical surface instead. So it's differential gene expression where these fish are able to um, move the location of this protein. This would be more similar to what the, the lumen of our kidney for reabsorption to occur. It's, it's not, right? This is actually outside of the um, body of the fish, but similar idea. So these three ions are moved into the cell, chloride, and also sodium can move out through this channel here. Pretty cool stuff, same proteins. Learning check three, answer these three questions for me here. <laughs>